So the last time we met, we were talking about constitutive models, right? So we we talked about we spent a couple lectures where we talked about strain. So a constitutive model is sort of our closure relationship because remember strain is just a function of displacement, right? It's a it's it's just essentially some function of the derivatives of displacement. And so uh, if we then have a way to relate strain to stress then we have a way to re relate displacement to stress, and therefore we can write our momentum equation completely in terms of unknown displacements, and then we can solve for them. Right? So we can solve for unknown displacements. We know how things will deform. We have some concept of the strength of the material. We can understand if that deformation is going to cause failure. Right? And if the rocks will fail, then that could <coughs> lead to wellbore instabilities, faulting, other things. And so uh, mainly we, we talked about elasticity or one form of it, uh, essentially ge the generalized Hooke's law, which you know, resulted in this equation here. So you have your, un your six unknown stresses, and then this matrix here is what relates the strains to the stresses. And there's just two independent constants. In this case, I wrote it in terms of Young's modulus and Poisson ratio, but we could equally write it in terms of bulk modulus, shear modulus, other things like that. Okay, so that's just review. Of course, what we care about is fluid filled rocks, right? And the, the fluid in the pores actually affects the deformation of the rock, right? And I think, you know, you all know this uh, just intuitively if you've ever handled a sponge, right? I mean, if you have a if you have a dry sponge, it it has one sort of modulus, right? One level of stiffness. If you have a wet sponge, it feels different, right? It has a different stiffness. <coughs> and and in the case, you know, of if you have a fluid saturated sponge, and say you were you could imagine if you were to seal the sponge so that when you squeezed it, no water escaped, right? So when you squeeze it, you're not only squeezing the the, the sponge, the the, the the, the solid material of the sponge, you're also squeezing the water, right? And of course, you can, you know, you know, you probably never done that. You can imagine what that that would be different, right? There's a difference. So the the water in the sponge, and our sponge is a rock, right? The water in the rock, or the fluid in the rock, the hydrocarbons in the rock affect the deformation, right? They affect the material response, okay? And and so what? The name for this is, you know, it's called poroelasticity. So now we're, we're, we're trying to, uh, we're, we're, we're developing a model that has, that incorporates the elastic stiffness of the matrix material, of the sponge material, but also incorporates the effect of the fluid in there in a way that we can do it in a simple enough way that we're not actually, you know, normally, if you want to solve for, this, for the motion of a fluid, what equation do you use? That's true if you want to solve for the velocity of a creeping fluid. If, in general, you want to solve for the motion of a fluid particle, what equation do you use? Could be turbulent, could be fast-moving flow, could be your flow through the river. Huh? It is F equals MA, actually, but there's a special name for it when we're talking about fluids. Navier-Stokes equations, right? So the Navier-Stokes equations is nothing more than the conservation of momentum equation, okay, or for a fluid. In fact, you can take the same conservation of momentum equation that we um, have, and you, then you just essentially, um, you know, the conservation of momentum equation that that we have wrote down in this class is something like u squared t squared. Equals to the divergence of the stress plus rho b, which is rho over here, right? And if you just assume that the stress takes the constitutive form of this, 
where u is the unknown velocity. This is the viscosity. So if you plug that into that equation, and uh, this, this thing is called a chronic or delta function that I've shown you guys that. It's, it's essentially like the identity matrix. So this thing is equivalent to the identity matrix. It takes on a value of, um, but this is just an aside. I'm not going to test you on this. But it, it takes on a value of 1 for i equals j and 0 otherwise. So if, if, if i and j go from 1 to 3, this, this ends up looking just like the identity matrix, right? For i equals j 1 to 3. Anyway, if you, if you take this equation and you stick it in there, you get something called the Stokes equation for incompressible flow, right? And Stokes equations, uh, they just don't have a convective term. And then you just have to take it one step further to realize that that velocity u moves with the particle, and there's something called a material time derivative, such that that uh, <coughs> this term here actually becomes um, since u is the velocity, it's uh, it's not the second derivative; it's just the first. So u is the velocity. Right? So then. That term becomes a term that looks like this. Excuse me, back to tensor vector. Anyway, so yeah, so we wrote conservation of momentum like that. If you just plug this constitutive relationship in and understand that the, that guy is equal to that. Um, because you're following the motion of the fluid, then you, that's the Navier-Stokes equation for incompressible flow. So it, it, is, it is that. Okay, so that was, that was just an aside. But uh, I'll just clear that off the slide. <coughs> um, okay, we don't want to solve the Navier-Stokes equations in the pores. There's graduate students that do that for research projects, but you can imagine trying to solve the number, you know, trying to solve the fluid flow through a pore network in an entire reservoir would be impossible, right? And and so we don't we don't do that. We, <coughs> we simplify it. We use Darcy's law and some other assumptions to get it down where we end up solving the pressure diffusivity equation for um, you know the motion of the fluid in the solid. And then of course now we have we. In, in the solution of the pressure diffusivity equation, we know the pressure, right? The pore pressure. Well, that pore pressure exerts a force on the pores of the solid, right? And so the assumptions we use in pore elasticity are basically if you have our sort of representative cube with some grant with some pores in it, the first assumption we make is that the, the pore network is interconnected. So that you have fluid motion through it. Okay, free free fluid motion through it. And it's uniformly saturated. Now that's that's the that's the um, that's the assumption that we'll make in this class. This is you know but as in general that we can remove that restriction that it could be partially saturated in, in some area. Um, we make the assumption that the total pore volume is small compared to the volume of the rock. So in other words, my figure is very, very inaccurate in the sense of the way I drew it, right? Uh, the, the total volume, so uh, basically, you know, um, if, uh, if our pore volume is the red, so we're going to call that like DVP. So, so dvp divided by dv, where dv would be the volume of the rock, so dv, then this guy needs to be uh, much less than 1. So, so the volume of the pores is small compared with the rock. 
And then the last assumption is that the pore pressure, the total stress acting on the rock externally, and the stress acting on the grains are statistically defined. So, so we have some external stress. This is our in situ stress. Yeah. Did I go? I go it wrong. Sorry. So, so we have our external stress. Um, you know, the, we the grains are sort of what we call these solid pieces that are separated by the pore networks, and of course. The stress builds up in those solid pieces at a micro scale through contact, right? These are <coughs> materials are in contact, right? And so, of course, if you were to zoom in with a microscope and look at every individual grain, you're not going to be in the state of perfect hydrostatic confinement like this. You know, you're squeezing every grain individually, right? It's not that's not going to be reality. Um, but but what we're going to assume is that if you take a large enough volume and you sort of average the localized forces over every grain, that they sort of average out to one value, okay? So that, that this whole, you know, the stress is acting on the grains, the pore pressure, the total stress acting on the rock externally are statistically defined. That, that's just a fancy way of saying that the, average are good, the averages of all the small fluctuations are a good approximation, right? So of course, you know, if you have a real fluid volume, you know, a real body as I've drawn it here, the pressure in every pore may not be identically to the 18th decimal place, the same value, right? But as long as they're close to one another, our approximations for poroelasticity elasticity are going to be valid, okay? And so, under these assumptions, then We have our definition of effective stress, which we've sort of already used, um, so that you know the total stress tensor is the stress tensor of the skeleton, the solid skeleton that you, you know that, that you measure in the laboratory. In other words, if you if you took your rock, which of course is full full of fluid and everything else, and and and, and pore networks and everything else, but you took it to the rock lab and you put it in an MTS machine, standard test apparatus, and you squeezed it. You know, the, the stress that you measure would be defined by this guy, right? And then you subtract off the pore pressure, and the pore pressure acts hydrostatically, so it acts only along the diagonal. So I there is the identity matrix. So it only affects the diagonal entries. Okay. Now this is this is primarily the definition we'll use in this class, but and this definition was introduced by this guy Terzaghi. But there is a, something called a, you know, an exact eff effective stress or the BO effective stress. And it's got this little correction coefficient right here. It's called BO's coefficient. And uh, I'll show you how that, next time I'll, I'll show you how that arises and where that comes from. Um, a lot of times it's a good approximation that this is one. And so therefore it just recovers that. But, but it's, in certain cases, it may not be one. And you, and you need to have it to have a good, good uh, model, effective stress model.